Well, good morning. Um, I, I am excited to be here. I, uh, I work on a system that I think is completely different than what most people do here. Um, but I, I've learned a lot from, from talking to people and, and from the talks. And so for this talk, my hope is that um, I can uh, it convince some of you that considering phenotypic plasticity is important to our broader understanding of evolving systems. All right, so currently, I am in my final year as a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. I work with Dr. Rick Relier, and um, during my time at Pitt, my broad interests have been to expand upon our understanding of how pesticides affect natural systems. And so, given that this is such a broad and interdisciplinary issue, um, I've structured my dissertation to integrate tools and theories from ecology, evolution and toxicology to better get at that question of, of how pesticides affect natural systems. And so um, I work primarily in aquatic systems um, and I'm interested in questions such as what are the ecological effects of pesticides? So um, how do these pesticides affect aquatic communities? And I work a lot in mesocosms and I ask questions such as how do pesticides alter species abundance, species diversity? Um, how can these chemicals change species interaction? And so um, in addition to the ecological side of this question, I'm also interested in the evolutionary aspect of this question. So specifically, how can aquatic populations deal with pesticides evolutionarily? And so I'm interested in whether these aquatic populations can evolve resistance to pesticides. And so um, a lot of my work focuses on, on non-target species, but I think the ideas and, and the theories that I'm gonna present today are, are widely applicable to a number of different taxa. And so, specifically, what I wanna do is talk about my work on phenotypic plasticity in the evolution of resistance. And so this talk is broken up into three sections. First, I want to talk about some background. So what does theory tell us about um, plasticity and how can it lead to the evolution of traits? Then I wanna talk about some empirical evidence. So what or can plasticity specifically lead to the evolution of resistance? And then I will finish off by talking about what I think are important, empirical, are important implications of this empirical evidence. And then also what are some important future directions that we do need to pursue to better understand how plasticity can lead to evolved resistance. Okay, so um, to begin with the background, I need to first define a couple terms. So tolerance versus resistance, they're terms that are commonly used in, in my field and they're thrown around a lot. So just to be clear, in this talk, when I'm referring to tolerance, I mean differences in susceptibility among species or life stages. So this is a, a relative measure. Now in contrast, when I talk about resistance, I mean the microevolution of decreased susceptibility over time. So this is a process. So the process of microevolution, I'm referring to as resistance. Otherwise, I'm referring to it as tolerance. All right, so now that we have the <laughs> definitions out of the way, um, let me just start with our current paradigm. So how we currently understand, yes. Okay, sorry, I have a tendency to speak softly, so if, if, I, if, I, if I'm too quiet, just signal me. <laughs> I think I'm talking loud, but not really. Also, just if you could stay in the room. Oh. Like this, you'll be, you'll be a room star. Okay, I'll stay here. Um, okay, so starting with the current paradigm of, of how we understand evolved resistance. So typically the process goes something like this. You have a population of organisms. They, they vary in their genetic diversity. So that's what I have the colors here representing. Now if this population were exposed to a pesticide, we might expect that some individuals would be susceptible and be eliminated from that population. But um, some individuals might have a trait, a genetic-based trait that allows them to be resistant. If this trait were heritable, then over time, we get the microevolution of resistance within that population. And so, in thinking about this process, I became really curious as to whether this process was the only way that evolved resistance could arise. And this was sparked by when I entered graduate school, there was just this huge emphasis on the role of the environment in shaping the evolution of traits. And so specifically, I wanted to ask what role the environment has in the evolution of traits associated with pesticide stressors. And so I wanted to know, can the environment induce greater tolerance? 
And specifically, this led to thinking about phenotypic plasticity. So phenotypic plasticity is the capacity of a single genotype to exhibit variable phenotypes in different environments. So for example, um, we have two tadpoles here. Uh, these two tadpoles were from the sa same egg mass, so they have very similar genotype, er, genotypes. The tadpole on the top was raised in an environment without predators, and the tadpole on the bottom was raised in an environment with predators. So even though they have similar genotypes, because they're in different environments, they're expressing different phenotypes. And so the key point that I wanted to get across here is these individuals can induce an adaptive phenotype within a single generation. So this has huge implications for how organisms respond to rapidly changing environments. And so um, to visualize phenotypic plasticity, what we typically use are reaction norm lines. So um, typical to these graphs, we have on the x-axis different environments, and then on the y-axis you have the trait of interest. So if we take our tadpole example, if we don't expect to see plasticity, this is the reaction norm line that we should see, a flat reaction norm line. So it doesn't matter what environment the tadpole is in, the tail depth, our trait of interest is going to be the same. Uh, contrast, if we do expect to see plasticity, then um, in the predator environment, we should expect a different tail depth than in the no predator environment. So we should see a slope line. So a slope reaction norm line indicates plasticity, a flat line indicates no plasticity. And so um, with this, again, with phenotypic plasticity, it allows for individuals to induce an adaptive phenotype within, the single, uh, within a single generation. But what's even cooler about phenotypic plasticity is theory predicts that over time, this induced phenotype can become fixed. So it can become constitutively expressed through the process of genetic assimilation. And so, in other words, what was initially induced can now just be expressed without the environmental cue through this process. And so the way that theory predicts this should work is you have a population that starts off with plasticity. Now, if this population is only exposed to the pesticide intermittently, so if it only shows up here or there, then it makes sense for that population to maintain its ability to respond plastically just in case the stressor were to arise again. But um, we know that there are costs to plasticity. And so in special circumstances, for example, when there's constant exposure to stressor, over time, we should predict that this reaction norm line should flatten out. And ultimately, you should get constitutive expression of that trait. So regardless of the environment, you're always expressing that previously adaptive inducible trait without the environmental cue. And so in thinking about the process from, from plasticity to how it can induce a phenotype to how it can become constitutively expressed through genetic assimilation, I was curious to apply this to uh, pesticide stressors. So can plasticity lead to the evolution of resistance? And so with that, um, I'm going to move on to the empirical part of my talk. Um, I hypothesized that if the evolution of resistance via plasticity were possible, it would happen in a two-step process. First, populations would be exposed to a sublethal dose of pesticide. Now, this wouldn't kill them, but it would induce, it would allow plastic individuals to induce increased tolerance. Now, these individuals would be, would be favored, leading to uh, their genes being passed to the next generation. Now, if plasticity is favored, or, and if the, the stressor is intermittent, then plasticity should be maintained in that population. But as I mentioned before, if there are costs to plasticity and the environment has a constant source of the pesticide stressor, then over time, it doesn't make sense to maintain that plasticity. So in these populations, you would lose the ability to respond plastically, but you still have constitutive resistance and that would happen through the process of genetic assimilation. And so uh, the one thing that I wanted to point out here is this endpoint, constitutive resistance, is the exact same evolutionary endpoint as our current paradigm, our current understanding of evolved resistance. The only difference is in our current understanding, it takes a lethal dose of pesticide to initiate that microevolutionary process to evolve resistance. What I'm proposing here is that it's a sublethal dose. This sublethal dose induces increased tolerance, and that, through genetic assimilation, could potentially lead to constitutive resistance, the exact same endpoint. And so to test these hypotheses, I had to ask two questions. First, is plasticity even possible? Can organisms even respond to pesticides and induce tolerance? 
And the predictions for this, again, are if there's a flat line, then no plasticity, regardless of the environment, whether it's sublethal pesticide or no pesticide, um, the tolerance is going to be the same. Now, in contrast, if we do expect to see plasticity, then in environments with sublethal insecticides, we should see an increase in tolerance relative to those in no pesticide. And so, in addition to asking whether plasticity were possible, I also needed to ask, well, is there evidence for genetic assimilation in nature? The prediction here is, if you start off with a, a plastic population, over time, if this population were exposed to a constant env uh, environment of pesticides, you get a flattening out of this reaction norm curve, and you end up with constitutive resistance. So they're expressing resistance regardless of the environment. Now, one way to test genetic assimilation is to, to take a population and follow it across time, an initially plastic population, and, and track it across time to see if it does lose that plasticity. The issue with this is it can take many generations, and, and within the confines of a dissertation, it, it wasn't really feasible. And so instead, what I did was I substituted space for time. So in populations far from agriculture, these populations are not going to be exposed as consistently to pesticides as populations close to agriculture. So we can use populations along the distance to ag from agriculture gradient to serve as a proxy for populations at different evolutionary endpoints. And so if I take populations far and close from agriculture, we can rework the predictions for genetic assimilation. If we have evidence that genetic assimilation is occurring in nature, then in populations far from agriculture that are intermittently exposed to pesticides, we should expect these populations to maintain plasticity. Now in contrast, in populations close to agriculture, we should expect these populations to um, express constitutive resistance. And so if these two criteria are met, then we would say that it's consistent with the theory of genetic assimilation. Okay, so to test these hypotheses, um, I, I worked with the insecticide Carbro. It's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. It's, it's commonly found in, in most hardware stores that I've been in. Uh, my model organism, was the, the Lithobati sylvaticus. Uh, these are the wood frogs, and they're, they're wonderful model organisms. Um, they're, they're explosive breeders, so that's really useful for obtaining a large number of organisms all at the same stage. So what I did was I went out to four different populations in northwestern Pennsylvania, and these four different populations varied in their percent agriculture within a 200 meter radius from a pond. And so I chose 200 meters because in the uh, past studies have shown that this is the distance that wood frogs travel. And so as you can see, um, populations close, or close to agriculture have a much higher percent agriculture compared to populations far from agriculture. And for the rest of the class, the red will represent um, populations far from agriculture and blue will represent the close to agriculture populations. Okay, so at each of the four populations, I collected 10 egg masses. So throughout this study, I kept the egg masses separate for each population. Then I individually separated embryos from the egg mass. And then I allowed these embryos to develop in pesticide-free water until they developed into the hatchling stage. At the hatchling stage, I began phase one of the experiment, which is the induction phase. So I exposed, I randomly chose individuals and exposed them to a sublethal dose of carbaryl. So either 0 0.1, 0.5, or 1 part per million of carbro. And this was a sublethal dose. It had no future effects on survival or mass of the individual. I allowed the hatchling to, to develop in these sublethal doses until they uh, became free swimming. And then at that point, I moved them back into pesticide-free water. And these hatchlings developed in pesticide-free water until they uh, developed into the larval stage. So here I began phase two of the experiment, so the time to death assay. So what I'm describing here is what I call the hatchling exposure experiment. So in addition to this, I also exposed embryos to a sublethal dose of pesticide and uh, moved them back to pesticide-free water and then also conducted a time to death assay. But because the results were, were generalizable, for today's talk, I'm just gonna focus on the hatchling exposure experiment. But if anybody's interested, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about it. Okay, so for the time to death assay, the goal is to ask if you were exposed to a sublethal dose of carbaryl as a hatchling, does that affect your ability to tolerate a lethal dose of pesticide later in life? And so to do this, I took tadpoles that were previously exposed to a sublethal dose of carbaryl 
and expose them to either a control or a lethal dose of carbaryl. And the control treatment is there just to, to demonstrate that our, our testing conditions were appropriate for the tadpole survival. And uh, we had about 98% survival, so um, for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus on the lethal concentration. Okay. So in this slide, this is my, my big data slide. Um, what you will see is all tadpoles here are exposed to a lethal dose. The only difference is whether or not they were exposed to a control or a one part per million concentration of carbaryl as a hatchling. And I did measure uh, four sublethal concentrations, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about one part per million. Okay, on the x-axis here, you have time to death. On the y-axis, it's proportion surviving. And so these are the populations that are close to agriculture. Now, this is what the survival curve of um, trailer park pond tadpoles exposed to control as a hatchling looks like. I'll compare that to the tadpoles exposed to one part per million as a, as, as a hatchling. So what you see here is it doesn't matter what sublethal dose the tadpole was exposed to, they are equally as tolerant to a lethal dose of pesticide. We see the same pattern for saw population. Sublethal exposure does not induce increased tolerance for the populations close to agriculture. And in contrast, um, for the populations far from agriculture, this is the time to death curve for those exposed to the control as a hatchling. Now this is the survival curve for those exposed to one part per million as a hatchling. And so here you see that exposure to a sublethal dose of pesticide induces increased tolerance to a lethal dose later in life. And so you see the same exact pattern with their population. So you see that increase in time to death. And so um, let me just uh, summarize this using the reaction norm line. We ask two questions. First, can individuals respond plastically to pesticides? The prediction is if they can, you should see that slope line. And for populations far from agriculture, that's what we see. In individuals that were raised in a hatchling environment with pesticides, they have a higher time to death than those in no pesticide environment. On contrast, um, well, our second question asks, is there evidence for genetic assimilation? And again, two criteria have to be met. First, there has to be plasticity in populations far from agriculture, and in populations close to agriculture, there has to be constitutive resistance. And that is what we find. So in populations that are close to agriculture, it doesn't matter what hatchling environment they're in, they're always expressing increased resistance. And so um, what, what these data provide is just the be a beginning uh, to explore how plasticity can, can lead to the evolution of resistance. So this serves as a proof of concept for future studies. And there are a lot of future studies that need to be conducted to uh, further explore this issue. But um, the major implication that I wanted to get across today is that sublethal concentrations need to be considered in our understanding of evolved resistance. Currently, a lot of focus is on these lethal concentrations and how those lethal concentrations can initiate the evolution of resistance. But hopefully what I've convinced at least some of you guys is that sublethal concentrations at least should be considered in our understanding of evolved resistance and what is their role in this process. Um, implications for this is imagine a target species, a, a, a neighboring target species that is inadvertently exposed to sublethal doses of pesticides. Can this affect future efforts to manage this particular population? Can it serve as sort of a, a source population of resistant organisms for those, uh, those fields? And then on the flip side of the coin, for non-target species, how can induced tolerance facilitate these populations? Can these sublethal concentrations allow these populations to persist? How, what, how does it affect population resilience? And then, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of future directions. This is just the first step. Um, as far as we know, this is the only study that looks at um, induced tolerance on vertebrate species. The only other example of induced tolerance would be in mosquitoes, um, done by Pupardin. Um, what we're trying to look at now is, is this result generalizable across different amphibian species, um, also across different invertebrate species. In addition to whether it's generalizable across taxa, we need to know is it generalizable across pesticides. There are a number of different pesticides available. Um, currently, what we do know is sublethal exposures of carbaryl can actually induce cross tolerance to different pesticides. So sublethal doses of carbaryl induces increased tolerance to malathion, 
and increased tolerance to cypermethrin, so different modes of action. And then finally, how long is induced tolerance retained? If you're exposed to sublethal doses early in life, does that mean you're set for life, or does it, does it go away as you, as you develop? And so um, I thought I'd just end broadly with the question. If induced tolerance is common and genetic assimilation is occurring in nature, then how does this challenge our understanding of evolved resistance? And specifically, can we incorporate phenotypic plasticity into our models of pesticide resistance? Can we incorporate these, the effects of sublethal pesticides? And so uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank Nimbus. I, this, I've learned so much. This is definitely out of my field, so I, I'm not a math person, so it's been, it's been really great. My lab, um, Nate Morehouse, my collaborator on this project, and the committee in front of this. And thank you for your attention, and if there's anything, I'd like to answer it.